what this now says to us is there are going to be other people in play. And, and you look at, yeah. you mentioned Concho, but you look at Pioneer, you look at EOG, all of them are trading 20, 30% below their peak from last summer. Right. And if you look at Anadarko, it's still below the peak of last summer. So this is going to be an interesting play. I think there's a lot of value here, especially if energy companies see that the price of oil is going to stay in this band. And I think once that band is there, the synergies that you can get out of some of these acquisitions, I think yeah, are going to be much I, I, better. Th you know, the super majors in the U.S. and Europe, they're going to look at this deal and say, okay, I, I need the presence in the Permian Basin and I and I listen we haven't had a deal since I think XTO and Exxon Mobil in, in 2009 right. and that was a disastrous deal a for Exxon. disastrous right. deal, but it was more of a natural gas deal than anything yep. else but this this is about the Permian and you just look at these super majors and it's almost like okay now we have to be there I'm still not sure though that Oxy is is the right uh, player in buyer this. desperation is a is a motivation, but yeah. then you look at the stock prices of Occidental and <laughs> Chevron, right. and you say, you know, it's it's obviously going to be a, a winner and loser equation. It's not like yeah, uh, and, and again, Occidental's a company that's kind of made the commitment to not pursue the inorganic growth, and the return on capital is so important to them. I think it's got a five percent dividend yield. That's so strategically important to them. So I, I'm suspicious yeah, of this. You know, if this fully aligns, I, I think you're right, and I think as a as an Anadarko shareholder, you probably want more of a Chevron there, just because you know the deal's going to get through. Right. Because the deal doesn't get through, there goes your stock price, and maybe nobody wants you after that. Um, Ali, you you uh, recently decided. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about Ox, maybe to change your opinion now, but uh, you're going to equal weight in the U.S. in terms of, uh, of assets because we're back to the highs, so you figure you're, or, or, or are you even going to underweight uh, at this point? You're, no. You know, go from overweight to, to neutral in the U.S. because we're back to the highs or something? Yeah, you, uh, UBS has basically made a, a relative call versus U.S. markets versus international. And, you know, we've seen a six-month complete U-turn in the U.S. markets, all-time highs, Australia at all-time highs as a result. Last night, you have the administration come out and further confirm potential progress on, on trade talks. And so basically you have, you know, you have a totally accommodative Fed, you have fading recession risks, and you have optimism, again, over the trade with supportive monetary policy. So the market has priced all that in, has come all the way off the lows. And, you know, basically what we've said there is a lot of the tailwinds that have pushed us up over, let's say, the last year and a half are, are really fading. We have a strong U.S. dollar. We have the tax package really behind us. And the, the rest of the world, let's, let's take Europe out of it because we're still seeing some signs of concern there. But the rest of the world specifically outside of, is being led by China into EM and, and Japanese growth. So we really think that the reacceleration is going to be experienced more there where it's still trading at, at a discount. But the, the global markets are priced for stabilization of growth, not acceleration. So this is... That's the way we think it. And we think, especially if you look at the numbers that have been coming out of China, we think things are, are really on the mend and we expect a pickup globally.